To begin this webinar regarding best recommended packages for Fresh Cut, I present to you our guest speakers for today, Dr. Jeff Brandenburg and Eric Vandercook. Both Dr. Jeff and Eric are members of the QFresh Lab GSB Group LLC, which is an international consulting and laboratory firm specializing in packaging designs and technology, post-harvest technology, packaging and food processing equipment, and food safety for the fresh food industry. Dr. Jeff Brandenburg is the president and CEO of the QFresh Lab. With over 43 years of experience in packaging technology, Jeff has a Bachelor's of Science degree in chemical engineering from Iowa State University with a minor in biomedical engineering, a master's science in food safety from Michigan State University. Eric is the director of QFresh Lab and has a Bachelor's of Science degree in biochemistry and food science, and has worked for over 15 years in various food industries, including fresh cut produce, fresh fresh juices, and dietary supplement. We are happy to have you, Dr. Jeff Brandenburg and Eric, for the purpose of this webinar. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Vlad. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jeff Brandenburg. I'm going to be introducing um, the topic and the study that was done. The primary part of the presentation will be done by Eric. It was him and his team who did um, all of this research. So he will be the one presenting it. And then I'll uh, provide a few summary uh, summarizing remarks at the end. So next slide, please. So from an overview standpoint, um, and you'll find throughout this webinar that optimal packaging for fresh cut mango relies on a number of different technologies all coming together. It's not just the packaging. It's not just the, um, the processing. It's not just the growing. It all has to come together in a coordinated fashion. Um, as we'll talk about towards the end of this, um, the specific type of packaging can be any one of a number of kinds of packages, depending upon what's best suited for the particular application, whether it's a food service, it's a retail, it's a quick service restaurant. Um, so in other words, trays, Pouches, bags are all possibilities, but there have to be parameters that are common to all of these packages. And this has to do with making sure that we've modified the atmosphere properly, that we have processed um, the fruit properly, uh, that we've got good temperature control, and that we make sure that we understand the specific package design and the specific requirements needed to optimize shelf life. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Eric to let him go into all of the detail. So Ken, if you can actually stay on this slide. Um, so what we were really tasked with was figuring out um, the appropriate uh, packaging for fresh cut mango, which can be modified atmosphere. It can be kind of rigid versus bag. Um, essentially, once you cut that produce, where do you actually store it? How do you store it? What temps do you store it? Um, what type of packaging might work best? Is it is there ethylene involved? Is there oxygen, carbon dioxide? Is it moisture more important than the rest? Um, we looked at all of this and, and essentially um, in combination with the literature. So if you go and look up the literature, um, I love reading literature on, on fresh cut and, and post-harvest physiology, um, not only to help guide my studies, but also to understand what's been done, how is it done? And, and you know, the main thing that we um, kind of figured out and, and looked into was that there was a lot of, there, there were hundreds of, of studies and I read every single one of them. Um, and a lot of the times the studies were just not quite designed for a commercial setting. 
Um, they would be measuring respiration rate in a closed chamber. They'd be measuring respiration rate with flow through methods, and it would both of which um, elevate the true respiration rate for a package design for a commercial um, processor. And so what we tackled was was a combination of, well, okay, how do we find the right commercial package in, in conjunction with how do you properly commercially um, cut and, and wash the product and, or, or not wash the product? Do you add dips? Do you not add dips? Are, are there intermediate steps that work in conjunction with modified atmosphere? And also, are there um, ones that are at odds with each other? Um, so if you look at pretty much any fresh cut fruit, any fresh cut vegetable, they all kind of work the same way. Um, when they're on a tree, when they're in the ground, they're they're fixing carbon dioxide and oxygen a little bit differently um, than when you cut them. They, they do the exact opposite. And understanding how they do that, um, where they do that, um, some of the peel on, peel off, are, are there, um, there, there are so many factors that can go into it. And what we attempted to do was um, eliminate as many as we could from a commercial setting and, and a commercial kind of view of how do we deliver the right package. And so there's no right or wrong package. Um, there, there's kind of optimized packages and sub-optimized packages is the way I look at it. And, and there's different ways of accomplishing all of that, um, which is the bulk of what we'll um, be, be talking about today as we as we go through these slides. I want to talk, uh, you know, we could have started anywhere here and, and trust me, we'll get into the, to the great stuff. And don't worry about walls of text. I will not simply be reading through these. Um, these are more for afterwards. Um, I want to really talk about what we found and and how we kind of attempted to push this forward um, a, as an industry. So one of the early problems we came across was just the, the level of peeling. So if you look at the literature, there's really nothing in there talking about how how deep you got to you got to get that top uh, layer off by by mango type and also how that affects some of the downstream respiration and how you match it to a package. But um, early on in our testing, uh, what I found was if you didn't get a topping and a tailing and a complete removal of that peel, like I'm talking completely, if there's any on there, that area just tended to brown with kind of no solution. Uh, low oxygen didn't stop it. Heavy amounts of antioxidants didn't stop it. I even went down as low as a vacuum sealed package with 0% oxygen, and I could not stop that browning if there was peel remaining. And so um, getting that peel off and getting that peel off consistently um, for our testing was was one of the first things that we had to, to solve for. And so um, as sharp a knife as possible and, and, and losing a little bit of yield was how you, you had to accomplish it. And if um, you didn't lose that little additional yield, then your product would have excessive browning. And that's what some of those um, pictures are showing there is that the, the ones that look nice and yellow or, or that nice orange and not going to that darker brown, um, we made sure to get the peel off on those ones. So leading into um, microbial effects. So if you look at um, fresh fruits or fresh cut veg, some of them are very sensitive to bacteria. Um, it could be a lactic acid bacteria. It could be general aerobic spoilage. Um, there's, there's just hundreds of different bacteria that can affect and affect each one, and they all kind of manifest a little bit differently. Um, there's no rule of thumb where you you process this way and we washed it this way and we used this and we kept a very clean room and, and that's very vital for certain items. Uh, fresh cut mango is definitely one that's that's more sensitive. Um, it does have a nice low pH, so it does prolong that kind of growth. And, and we actually did some some growth studies, which I'll show here. Um, but what I like to, how I like to think of it is like every fruit, every vegetable, every fresh cut has has a different magic trick. They have a different prestige. Um, the setup's the same. The the way they kind of react and, and respire and put off heat and, and maybe they're sensitive to ethylene, maybe they're not. Um, all of those feed into it. But at the end of the day, each one of them has their own kind of idiosyncrasies. Um, so specifically looking at mango. Um, it's got a low pH. It's got high sugar. The low pH helps with um, bacterial growth, so it helps to to allay and push out some of those growth curves. But also, the high sugar are, is at odds with that because now you have the right substance for bacteria to grow. Um, 
And, and so what we found in the literature and, and studying it ourselves is that it, it definitely seemed to be more yeast um, kind of mold driven versus general spoilage bacteria driven. Um, but one of the best ways to control yeast growth is by starving a product of oxygen. So you starve the product of oxygen, maybe using a gas flush, maybe you're using a really low um, environment inside of your package. Maybe you're also storing the mango um, in a controlled environment where you're, where you're dropping the oxygen. But as we'll see in the next slide, um, the two are, are at odds with each other, which is a major bummer. So, Ways to control yeast. So I, I mentioned a couple. I'm not again. I'm not going to go through all this, but um, essentially, when you're looking at kind of bacterial growth and browning or, or discoloration effects on a fresh cut product, um, it's it's typically one or the other. It's it's enzymatic growth or enzymatic um, activity um, that that causes browning, or it's um, bacterial growth of some sort causing causing the browning. And so the way to stop that typically um, is to drop the oxygen inside of a package really, really low. Um, so you can do this by gas flushing with pure nitrogen, um, displacing the amount of oxygen that's in there, targeting a, a much lower starting oxygen percentage. Um, but what we found in, in the literature was very erratic and, and hit or miss on this. Sometimes they would say, oh no, we went down to 2% oxygen and it looked great. That was obviously our, be our best outcome. Other times, anytime they talked about going below 10%, they, they saw that there were potential issues. Um, and what we found was that going really, really low in oxygen just didn't really help the browning. So like I said earlier, we, we tested very low gas flushes, very low OTR films, um, very low residual oxygen, and none of that stopped the browning if there was any peel left on the mango. Um, the mango itself didn't really brown um, as long as there was kind of a moderate oxygen um, inside of the package. And so uh, they also didn't like high CO2. So if the carbon dioxide inside of the package rose above a certain level, all of a sudden um, the product really didn't like that. It, it started to develop a lot of tissue softening. So if you look at the literature, the literature is very discreet on on, on this. Um, they talked about kind of any time that you got above about 10% carbon dioxide inside of a package, it started to soften. And so we tested that multiple different ways. And we found that it was like all things, a, a dose, time time dependent response so the longer it sat at high co2 um and the higher that co2 was uh the faster that tissue softening set in as soon as tissue softening set in um bacteria uh growth started to set in with it um basically the the cells of the product were breaking down um causing really high uh issues with tissue softening and bacterial growth and so um, unfortunately, the two are kind of at odds with each other. So I, early on in my testing, I thought that a, a gas flush, uh, matching that to a, to a nice kind of 5% residual oxygen, control the CO2 a little bit, and, and we're going to, boom, we solved it. Um, that's not really the case, unfortunately. Um, the, the two are at odds with each other. And so you kind of have to, you have to play the middle on, on, on this, on this product. You can't go too low in oxygen. You can't go too high in CO2. And so that, that does, um, limit the amount of options that you have available to your packaging, which which we'll we'll get into here as we keep going. So this is um, a growth curve, and, and I apologize. It, uh, I did have some lines dr drawn on this, similar to you know showing your lag phases and your log phases and your exponential phases, but it looks like that that came a crowd. But um, what this is is over time. Um, how, how much our general APCs uh, increase. It's a log scale there on your y-axis. And um, we basically sent it every few days to the lab for, for analysis. And the, the pink dots there um, are no modified atmosphere and the blue dots are modified atmosphere. So we did not do a gas flush. We just use a modified atmosphere. Um, we targeted an in-between um, about 8% oxygen, about 10% CO2 is what we were getting. And what we found was um, a pretty standard bacterial growth curve throughout, um, but that the modified atmosphere, now keep in mind, this is not food safety. We were looking at general APCs. Um, the mod and, and this is backed up through tons of modified atmosphere um, literature that we saw about a one, you know, 0 0.6 to 1.1, 1.2 log differential as time went on. 
between a modified atmosphere and a non. So the modified atmosphere did help us to control that bacterial growth. Um, again, this is not food safety. This is kind of general spoilage organisms and um, how they manifest on fresh cut mango. Um, so the, the literature, so there's multiple ways bacteria can grow. Um, the literature was pretty sparse on, on kind of the mode of action inside of mangoes. Um, what we found was that the starting um, bacterial loads were really low um, for the most part, like really, really low um, every time that we did our fresh cut. Uh, what we did find was um, what I believe to be chill injury setting in later in shelf life. So typically when you... Um, when you cut a fresh product, e even if it's a chill, chill sensitive product, such as mango, which, you know, you store at 55 or above or, or at chill sensitivity, again, is dose time, uh, dependent. So it, it can, what we found is it can withstand some chill injury for quite a while in the whole, whole state. Typically, once you cut it into a fresh cut state, it's even more, ch it, uh, chill sensitivity almost goes away typically. Um, I, I think, and there's. I've never really found a good mode of action, but I, I think the mode of action on mango is that that peel is acting as um, basically its barrier. Um, it's learned how to breathe through that through that peel at a certain rate when it's warm, and as soon as you get it cold, um, and, and I I saw this numerous times, and we'll I'll show some pictures later. Um, the lenticels and the pores inside of the mango changed. Um, so the longer that I stored it cold in the whole state, they got really large. They tried to, um, the mango was essentially trying to breathe and it couldn't. And at the fresh cut stage, that usually goes away. Um, so it's usually not too chill sensitive. But what I did find on, on fresh cut mangoes in particular was that towards the end of shelf life, um, they really softened rapidly and they really started to show this um, kind of water soaking type of appearance. And, and this was kind of across all packages that I tested. And then what, what happened is now the cell structure breaks down really rapidly. Now you've got um, this spilling of all the contents that bacteria needs to grow. And, and almost instantly you see the bacterial growth and kind of that end of shelf life. And so um, I think pushing out that curve as long as possible um, for when that chill sensitivity sets in is, is, is one of the most important things that can be done for fresh cut mango is um, on both the whole mango side and on the the, um, the fresh cut side. So on the whole mango side, um, we tested various lengths of how long um, it could withstand, say 36 degrees, 41 degrees, um, kind of 50 degrees storage prior to processing. Um, and we, we pushed those days out at, at different temperatures longer. And essentially the colder you get and the longer you put it there, um, the more chance, chill sensitivity sets in before you even cut it. But um, I think most processors are, are pre-chilling this product. And so what we found was you could pre-chill the product to, to 34, 35, 36 degrees for several days. And it didn't seem to, um, to really have a negative downstream effect post, um, cutting. Um, so post turning into a fresh cut product, um, the, as long as kind of the, those lenticel development didn't get really large. And as long as the internal, um, uh, flesh didn't start to get that water soaked appearance, um, it was, it was pretty good. You could, you could kind of pre-chill and get away with it, which, which I thought was pretty fascinating. So, um, in conjunction with the packaging, one, one really important, um, thing that we wanted to kind of highlight here and, and talk about were the combination of, um, dips in, in sprays and coatings with modified atmosphere. So if you look at the, um, the literature, the literature oftentimes kind of talked about um, this dichotomy where um, the, the modified atmosphere didn't love some of the dips or didn't love some of the coatings. And, and they talked about kind of there being um, a, a mismatch of using kind of any sort of coating. And when I'm talking about coatings, I'm talking about um, alginates, which I'm not sure anyone is actually using, but uh, it was one of the more fascinating findings. But your, your nature seal type things, your calcium chlorides and your ascorbates and your citric acids, um, they, and what we found was, um, there wasn't really a, a competing issue. Um, it was really more around your hurdles and kind of stacking which one worked together for your system. And so what I mean by that is, is coatings 
are not going to be negatively affected by your modified atmosphere packaging. It, it, it's only going to help um, the two in combination once you once you get that correct. And so some of the stuff that we were testing here was um, high CO2 gas flushing. Um, this is something that can be done really simply in a commercial um, setting. Um, most vertical form fill seal or um, clamshell type packaging, um, lidding film packaging has the ability to gas flush. Most of them are using nitrogen. Um, nitrogen is simply a displacement. CO2 would actually be like an active um, modified atmosphere flush where you're trying to kind of give it a hit of CO2 early, um, knock some of that bacteria down and hopefully be beneficial in the long run. And what we found was it did not tolerate high CO2, even for very short periods of time. I'm talking 10, 15 minutes at high CO2 and kind of letting that dissipate and sealing. Um, that led to premature tissue softening. Um, so one thing the literature got very right is, is kind of that level of CO2 and tissue softening in, in fresh cut mango. And that's one of the most important things that we've found with package design is basically not going above 10% CO2 in your package and not doing it for more than a couple days. So it, it can tolerate it for a day or two, but once you get above about 10% and, and once you get above two or three days of that value, um, really rapidly setting in that tissue softening, which which had so many negative downstream effects, right? Um, not only on textures and aromas, but especially on that, that bacterial growth. And, and so the other reason that we tested high CO2 was for that bacteriostatic effect, right? So we wanted to knock that initial micro down and we tried to keep it down as long as possible. But again, the two are at odds with each other. So it wasn't really a solution that, that we would have anyone kind of look forward to or look into any further than, than this. So um, another one, so go down to the, the second bullet point here. And this is um, a pretty fascinating result because most of the literature, when I get across this type of kind of alginates and coatings, and it, it gets really fishy really quickly and never holds up. And, and yet I did some um, some low percentage alginate coatings in combination or not in combination um, with some ascorbates and some calcium uh, chloride type applications, trying to firm up the textures, trying to stop any of that browning, trying to um, solve for some kind of bitterness of the, of the mango later in shelf life. And the alginate in particular was fascinating. And, and um, the mode of action definitely seem to be um, kind of locking in and slowing down the respiration rate of the product in combination with kind of keeping um, bacterial growth um, at bay while simultaneously kind of locking in that that aroma and the texture um, and the flavor. Uh, these alginate coatings were incredible at that. Now, as we'll see, as I go into the next couple slides, you'll see maybe potentially some of the downfalls of that and kind of the commercial application pieces of it. But I didn't really... Uh, excuse me, optimize it on my end. Um, I think it could have been more optimized in, in terms of um, a lower percentage in delivering um, something a little bit better because um, it had it, it worked in conjunction with modified atmosphere as well, where um, again, the literature on this kind of talked about and, and posited some modes of action that I didn't find um, when I did it. it. They worked fantastically together. Um, so going in, so again, I, I mentioned some of the ascorbates. Um, you can you can look at these. Um, I'm sure any any commercial processor is, is tested and, and maybe worked with some and not others, but it does help with um, some of that texture when you get the, kind of the percentage right. It does help with any kind of downstream browning type effects. Um, it can help mitigate them, but the ascorbic um, can penetrate. Um, so it can really penetrate into that fresh cut mango. Fresh cut mango is a little bit of a softer fruit and, and it seemed to kind of lead to some premature water soaking effects and premature breakdown, which I think possibly might be able to get solved with some different um, tweakings of those percentages. But I, I tried several and, and couldn't really make it work. Um, and then the other one was kind of the, the other end. So sometimes we got kind of excessive dehydration and texture loss, even though we added some extra moisture to the product. And that's just the, kind of those downstream effects later on that you don't, you know, you, you don't really know ahead of time, which just can, can happen in this type of product. So, um, so 
I, I don't know if the pictures come across as clearly as I remember this, but this was one of the more shocking results I, I came across and, and I did it by accident. Um, we were testing some of the ascorbates, some of the calcium chlorides, and, and with some of the with and without some of the alginate um, in various packaging. And I had done my eval for the day. This product was 16, 17 days old. A lot of it was was going kind of completely um, bad. And yet I left some out and I came back the next day. And this is what they look like. Um, it almost looked like candied mango um, with the alginate coating. But I, I cut them open and I, and I tasted them and they were incredible. They locked in the aroma, locked in the flavor. Um, I imagine the shelf life that on this would be uh, damn near infinite the way it, it almost looked when I, when I was testing it, but these, these coatings that can help lock in some of those flavors and aromas also have effects on the bacteria and how the product will, will do later on. And they work with modified atmosphere. So I think there's more work to be done here. I definitely don't want to have people start selling kind of almost candied mangoes, but um there, there's definitely some some really good science behind how this is actually helping the mango extend shelf life. So um, I, I'm not going to go through all of this, but uh, the, we looked at the literature extensively and kind of pulled together some of the more important pieces that we thought were were useful to to evaluate. We we evaluated a lot of these and either kind of confirmed or you know I they they posited this idea, but I think it can keep going. I think there's more to it than that, that we can tweak. Um, and so we did test a lot of this um, and the results, uh, you know, as you'll see in, in, in this, not only this, but we have a separate report, which I believe will be released um, where you can see the, the method to my madness. So the background behind the tests and um, how in depth we went. So um, I wanted to, to explain a little bit of respiration rate testing. Um, we'll go through this pretty quick, but essentially you can use kind of three systems. There's a closed loop system where you're basically, let's say you have a mango and you're dropping it into a jar and you know the size of the jar and you know the initial auction in the jar and you know the weight of the product going into the jar. Um, you can measure that change in gas inside of there and come up with a, a respiration rate. Remember, respiration is a rate. So it depends on how you test it as to how um, well that matches to the packaging later on. And so we found the closed system doesn't, it's kind of maximum respiration. It doesn't really help you on the on design, uh, package design. And so we don't use that. Um, one very common way that is done today is, is using a constant uh, flush or mix of gases. So let's say they want to test, oh, uh, we want to test this at 3% oxygen and 10% CO2, and they'll just continually put that gas mixture into there and measure how the product is responding. We use a little bit different method. Um, we use a, a closed system, but it's um, an active closed system. So we use packaging itself. So we know the OTR of the package, we know the amount of product going into the package, and then we have ways to measure the gases inside of the packaging. And the combination of those factors gives us the true respiration rate. So it's the respiration rate at the value we're targeting. So if we're targeting, say, 10% oxygen, 10% CO2, I design my packaging that way when I test respiration. And so I, I hit that number and then I measure the respiration rate at that number. And so the reason that that's important is that um, you you design your respiration to the, to the appropriate package already. And then when you get to package design, now you've got a very accurate respiration rate um, that feeds directly into that package. So... Um, these are some of the results. Uh, I'll just kind of top line it. Um, if you look in the literature, the results are, are higher than this for the most part for a fresh cut um, uh, mango. And um, the reason for that is what I just explained. So it's it's how you measure it. So it's that closed system, that open loop system, or the, the method that we use. And what I found through the years is the method we use for package design, especially. There's other, there's other reasons why you test other ways for the other ones. But for package design, the values I put forth right here are what I would what I would advise. So I would advise looking at your distribution chain and understanding um, where you fall um, on that. Are you using Kent's? Are you using Tommy Atkins? Are you using the Tolfos at this time of the year? Um, what is your expected distribution chain? Are you expecting it to be nice and cold, 36 degrees? Go ahead and use the left column. 42 or above, go ahead and use the right column. Somewhere in between, use somewhere in between. 
um, the, the nice thing about this is that um, it feeds directly into that package design piece of it. And so if you understand this, now you can go design a package properly um, that's going to get you that moderate CO2 level, not going too low in oxygen, and, and kind of combining all these factors I'm talking about specifically for fresh cut mango, which can be so, it, it's a very finicky product as I've found. Um, so this was just some of the some of the testing we did on a, on a few of our tests. There, there's a whole bunch more on top of this, so I, I won't stay on, on this one very long. But um, all of this was tested in conjunction with modified atmosphere or not modified atmosphere. That was the main thing I wanted to get across here because um, you can test in a in a bag, you can test in a vented clamshell, you can test in a lidding clamshell, and um, they all offer you something different um, from a keeping the product safe standpoint. So clamshell packaging, get, offering more rigidity in, in the product, not getting as bruised and damaged, but also being more limited in the target. You can kind of pick in your oxygen levels and a linen clamshell kind of marrying the two, but still not exactly what might be needed for different size of packaging you're packing because um, it can only use micro perforations, which can kind of throw off some of the some of the types of package you want for a fresh cut mango. Um, so th that's just kind of what I was trying to get across on this one. So um, there's no silver bullet. Uh, what I've found throughout the years is, regardless of what you're doing, there's no silver bullet in any fresh cut application. It's really understanding and stacking as many kind of hurdles and understandings on top of each other so that at the end of the day, you have a robust product. So properly peeling it, properly keeping your rooms cold, um, solving for high CO2, solving for not going too low in CO2 or uh, oxygen. So I kind of call this the Goldilocks situation. So, um, you know, we can't have a bed too big and a bed too small. It's got to be just right. And it, it's very much a balancing act um, at Fresh Cut Mango to get these these solutions correct. And so um, you won't see it here, but the report that we'll have available, um, we actually designed like 50 different packages um, using different respiration rates, different size of the packaging, different clamshells versus bags, different respiration rates that is that, that will be available. Um, that's something that didn't really exist in the literature. So the, the, the lit will kind of talk about, oh, here's your respiration and, oh, we tested this package, but that's as far as it'll go. It won't help you with, well, okay, this is my system. This is my distribution chain. This is the, the types of mangoes I'm using. This is what I expect them to go into and how to, how to match the two. And so that, that's something that we included inside that report, which will be available. Um, but there, Mango in particular was it was a pretty a pretty tricky one. Um, it, it definitely did not like high CO2. It definitely did not need or like low oxygen either. And, and typically one or the other usually works pretty well to prolong shelf life. And that wasn't really the case. And so, mango. So um, just a continuation of of, of what came prior. Um, that there's kind of no silver bullet. Modified atmosphere is definitely helpful on, on fresh cut mango. We definitely found over and over again when we tested no modified atmosphere versus modified atmosphere, you're looking at a three to five day improvement in shelf life. That was proven over and over in our testing. Um, but it, it, it's not one that can push it seven, eight days. Some products can go really, really far in modified atmosphere. And um, mango wasn't, uh, unfortunately, wasn't one of them. And so we found that smaller pack sizes were more better better candidates for breathable films. And so what's a breathable film? That's where the polymer itself breathes throughout the entirety of it. Um, so there's ways of, of accomplishing um, modified atmosphere. So you can get it through perforations. Um, perforations act differently than the polymer itself breathing. And so both of them are important from a package design standpoint. And um, breathable films help to um, lower carbon dioxide and it helps with not getting that tissue softening, especially if you're, let's say you have a package and it's only three ounces and you have one perforation. Now you might go pretty high in CO2, um, which we found has a negative effect. But if you pair that with the polymer, which is also breathing, which is also allowing more CO2 out for you, now you can kind of match the two together. And so there are some kind of um, some more interesting packaging coming out. And if Jeff has time, I know I keep talking, um, we'll get to it. But um, 
the like thermal fiber trays are coming out with a liner inside of them so that the tray itself can have a, a polymer liner and breathe without having the kind of excessive moisture loss that you find typically in a fiber tray. And then you can combine that with a linen film over the top, which you can now perforate. And so now you've got more options coming on the market um, that, that are actually quite beneficial to fresh cut mango. Um, so again, wall of text, um, what we found was uh, peel completely removed um, and there was really no good way to completely solve for browning otherwise. Um, even dips and, and, and sprays and all kinds of other things didn't really help. I even completely vacuum flushed some of this product, 0% oxygen, put it in a polymer packaging with very low uh, oxygen, checked them consistently with almost no oxygen. And if there was too much peel left, that product still browned, which was, was it blew me away. I thought I could stop that completely with a gas flush and, and, and vacuum, but I couldn't. And then so continuing on that um, kind of that alginate piece that I, that I touched on earlier, but um, setting a product out at room temp overnight on accident with alginate and, and, it, and it still being edible and juicy and um, not really developing off odors and not developing bacteria. I thought that was just a really fascinating um, outcome. So commissary, um, we wanted to, as a part of this, we wanted to kind of see what commissary was up to. Um, and, you know, they're they're kind of prepping inside of a store or maybe a central location and shipping it to a store. And consistently, their biggest issue was exactly what I've been kind of talking about was too much peel on there. And anytime they had too much peel, now it starts to brown within a day. And now nobody's buying that product. Whereas if all they did was get a little bit more peel off, they could make that five, six, seven days, whatever they're, uh, I think in the US, five days for a commissary is, is, is law. But um, without get, without that complete peel, so even in the wrong package, even just shoving it into whatever the heck they have sitting around, usually those cylindrical tubs with the lid on top, um, even with all of that, uh, as long as you get the peel off, it'll it'll have no no browning um, and, and no bacterial growth in that time period. And even in the wrong atmosphere, modified atmosphere really works a little bit later in shelf life. So it's not those first five six days that are important for modified atmosphere. It's on the back end. It's it's those late days when you're trying to push your product 14, 15, 16 days. That's where modified atmosphere shines. Those first four or five days, the product will will be fine. Um, it, it, as long as you get that peel off. So this is just a quick shot of kind of temperatures and this is US based. So this is there's 10 different retailers. This is tens of thousands of data points. This is all data that I've collected personally from um, from cases uh, uh, of storage. And, and so what I'm really highlighting here is if you look at all the stuff on the left, that's the, that's the, the main display case. So that's what they set their display case to. So when I walk in there and I see 36 degrees, that's kind of what the, the case is. And then what I would do is I'd, I'd check the infrared temperature of one towards the front of the case versus one towards the back of the case. And if you look at the first and the third kind of set of data here, you'll see they almost match exactly. And that's because whatever you set your case to and whatever your case is actually reading, that back package will be rock solid right at that number. But that front package, on average, is about eight degrees warmer. And so that that's where modified atmosphere needs to have kind of leeway when you design it. So you can you can design a package for the perfect um, optimal temperature and the perfect optimal product going in there, the right amount, the right cut, et cetera, et cetera. But if a, a retailer all of a sudden stores at eight, nine degrees warmer, you're done. Um, that product's going to go way too low in O2, way too high in CO2 and have all kinds of issues. And so it's important to design that in your package. And that's something that we take into consideration. So I wanted to show you this just to why it's so difficult to optimally design a package. And then um, again, this will be, these will be disseminated, but um, this was our conclusions um, in combination with some of the um, literature combined with um, the findings that we found. So essentially, if you look at the blue on the bottom right there, kind of putting it all together, what we found is uh, more peeling versus less. You might lose a little bit of yield on the front end, but you're going to get a much better product on the back end. Topping and tailing, so getting rid of that kind of stem side and the opposite side of that stem, that those that's had the largest lenticels, that had the largest pores, which leads to the most downstream browning effects. Um, a clean process. So um, this is definitely a product that even though it starts with very low bacteria, um, 
it has the tendency to to get bacterial issues as kind of its number one breakdown um, and it is in combination with tissue softening so if you kind of solve for one you usually solve for the other in conjunction with it so tissue softening is a big piece of it um, it needs a mod moderate atmosphere so not too low in oxygen what we kind of said was five and fifteen percent oxygen what i would really kind of target is closer to ten percent just so you make sure you don't go below um, once we went below five percent oxygen what we found really consistently was just off odors off flavors developing really, really rapidly. And then also with high CO2, we found just high CO2 having really bad effects with tissue softening. Um, so one really fascinating result that we found that I didn't really touch on here was the, the natural wounding response of a fresh cut mango. So fresh cut mango, every single product can basically has its own wound response. So if you cut grass, it's got a different wounding response than cutting, cutting a fresh cut mango or a fresh cut apple, but they all have some sort of wounding response. Some of those are, are very short lived. Some of those are very long acting. Some of those put off juices or compounds or whatever it may be to heal that site that you, that you, that you introduce. And what some testing that we did was we actually took um, CO2 and we um, basically used a fresh cut mango piece and then blew its own kind of wounding response juice uh, to kind of coat it. And we found some really fascinating results, um, helping to lock in moistures and flavors and aromas um, uh, and also uh, helping with tissue softening, helping with downstream bacterial effects. Like the, the results were pretty astounding, but it we only found them with CO2 gas. We tried nitrogen, um, we tried some other inert gases and it, and it was, it seemed to be a combination of the CO2 gas helping with the bacteria static in combination with kind of keeping some of that wounding response on the product, which had downstream helping effects. And then anti-browning solutions, we saw, we saw more negative effects than positive. Some of them did help, some of them, some of them hurt. Um, and, and so fresh cut mango is a very difficult product to, to extend shelf life on. So thanks, Eric. I want to just wrap up briefly um, and talking about a, a bit on sustainable packaging. As Eric mentioned, and, a, and a, as I mentioned early on in the webinar, we can create all different kinds of packages that can um, optimize the shelf life of fresh cut mango. And that includes sustainable packaging. Um, a couple of key points around sustainable packaging is that, again, there is no ideal package. There is no perfect package. And you have to make sure, well, and not only that, but the more you ask the packaging to do, the more difficult it is to come up with sustainable options. So you really need to understand what it is you want this package to do and how are you going to create a more sustainable package and what does that mean? Does that mean a biopolymer? Does that mean compostability? Does that mean recyclability? Um, and all of that can be factored in. Next slide, Ken. So there is a whole bunch of different kinds of bio-based and biodegradable packaging material out there. Some of it works very well, some of it not as much. One of the challenges with these kinds of materials is that you don't want it to start biodegrading until the instant you throw the package away. And so how do you flip that switch? You need to make sure that package does everything it's supposed to do during its life during from the time you put the mango in it until the consumer consumes it. But then the instant the consumer consumes it, you want it to start to degrade. And a lot of these things are triggered by moisture. And mango is going to have a lot of moisture inside that package. So this becomes a challenge. And a lot of these slides I'm going to go through very quickly. And they're really meant more as a resource for you as you continue looking down the path of sustainability. But there, when you talk about a bio-based or biodegradable packaging material, it's not just one material. There's a whole series of them. Next slide. And you can see here, all of these boxes are considered uh, possibilities for sustainable packaging and for biodegradable polymers. So it really is going back to what is it that I need the package to do and what can I find to do that in the best form. Next slide. Um, and then the other thing you need to understand about biodegradable packaging is it's actually a two-step process. 
The first is depolymerization. And that basically is you're taking a big piece of polymer and you're breaking it up into a whole lot of small pieces of polymer. That's relatively easy and that technology has been around for a while. It's the second step known as mineralization, which occurs inside the cell where the fragments are converted into biomass, minerals, salts, water, and gases. Without that second step, you actually don't have a truly biodegradable product. Next step. And here again, you can see, especially that step one, where you're breaking that big polymer down into much smaller polymers. And then that second part is where you're taking those smaller polymers and you're allowing them to, to break down into base molecules. Next slide. The other thing that's really, really important when you, well, it's important with all packaging, but it comes even more important in sustainable packaging is make sure that the package can withstand what you're planning to do with it. So if you're going to cook in the package, uh, if it's going to be a hot fill application, um, more and more fresh cut produce items are in, in ready meals where they're putting things like mango and fruits and ready meals. They're actually cooked inside the package. So you have to make sure the package can withstand that. Next slide. And again, just a list of all the various polymer properties that a package may or may not need to uh, have in order to go through the distribution channel, the retailer, the food service, uh, wherever and however the package is going to be used. Next slide. Um, also, and this is an area of growing research, it's an exciting area where people are now looking at polymers from actually food products, uh, where they're taking mushrooms, kelp, milk, tomato peels, uh, and using and making plastics out of them. So there's a lot, of, some of these are um, very new, some of them uh, are not tremendously economically viable but it's changing and it's changing every day you know our company's been involved in sustainable packaging for 15 20 years now and i will tell you that in the last five years it has changed almost monthly as to what's available and and what can be brought to bear but it's again it's important to understand and it bears repeating there is no perfect package it's finding out, and it's it's about compromise. What are you willing to compromise on? If you're going to look at a fiber-based package, then you're going to have to compromise on visibility, and you need to understand that. If it's a bio or biodegradable package, you may have to compromise on how, how often you order or how quickly you bring product in because you don't want it to start degrading. So it's going back and understanding what it is you need and what technologies can be brought to bear. You heard Eric mention hurdle technology. Same thing is true with sustainable packaging. You look at steps and you add all those steps up and you come up with a package that's right for you. Next slide. So again, and, and just to kind of finish up the whole seminar, Optimally designed packaging plays a critical role. As Eric said, you need to get that oxygen down. You need to get the CO2 up, but not too much. So you have to understand the fundamentals. And at the end of the day, you have to understand what are the customer requirements and what creative technologies can be brought to bear. If all you need is five-day shelf life, as Eric mentioned, you've got a whole host of packaging that can be used. If you need 10, 15, 17-day shelf life, well, then it's whittled down as to what is applicable, and you have to make sure you've got that peeling technology, possibly in combination with coatings, in combination with proper modified atmosphere. So it... It all depends on what's needed and what can be brought to bear. So when you're talking to your packaging companies or you're talking to people like us, really what you're looking for is a technical support service that actually happens to include packaging. 
Packaging must be an integral part of the new product development process. You will never optimize mango, fresh cut mango packaging if you choose your packaging the week before launch, especially if you need in addition to five days. And don't forget, and of course, we have a lot of um, guests on this talk from Central and South America, which is great, because this is a global effort in a global market. And Ken, I believe that's the last slide. Thank you, Dr. Brendan Berg and Eric van der Kook. We have time for a couple of questions. We, hit, we did not receive any question from the Q&A um, icon at the bottom of the screen. So we'll allow uh, about one minute to see if there is any participant that has any question that we may ask our panelists at, the, at this moment. Looks like we do have one question. Um, how does mango packaging differ from other fresh fruits? Well, in, in some ways it doesn't. Um, conceptually, you're looking at the physiological properties of the mango and you're matching them with the transmission rate and the physical properties of the packaging. That concept is true for all fresh fruits and vegetables. What sets mango apart are those physiological properties, its respiration rate, its moisture level, its ability to grow yeast or mold. And so all fresh cut produce packaging and its ability to accept or not accept coatings and its ability to what atmosphere does it like to live in. So all fruits and vegetables have different respiration rates. Some of them are very similar. Some of them are significantly different. All fruits and vegetables like to live for optimal shelf life in a certain modified atmosphere. So whenever you're designing a package, especially for mango, you need to understand what those post-harvest physiological properties are combined with what the distribution channel is, the quantity, the time of year, temperature, all of that, and you create a package that's unique to mango and unique to those physiological properties that it has. Thank you, Dr. Brandenburg. Uh, we would like to also announce that on October 17th, we will have another uh, webinar uh, from Dr. Reginaldo Baez Sanudo regarding the studies to, for the determination and control of the presence of cavity in the Mongo pulp. It would seem that we do not have any more question at this time. With this, uh, we would like to once again, thank you very much, Dr. Jeffrey Brandenburg and Eric van der Kook uh, for your participation in this webinar. Uh, we also thank our participant and our host and panelists as well. Uh, with this, we say thank you, and uh, we hope to see you back on October 17th for another webinar with the National Mango Board. Thank you, everyone.